Yes, some good news. So we, the good news is we are continuing on in Revelation chapter 3. Now, I know we have gotten through the first couple verses, first few verses of the Church of Philadelphia. So uh, we last time talked about these Jews who were falsely so-called. And we discussed particularly this crazy concept of replacement theology that's been around since the early church that is an incorrect concept. It's not biblical, and it doesn't follow what Paul or Jesus or anyone teaches. So just because something, that's the one final point to make out of that, just because something was believed by the early church does not make it biblical. If it's taught in the Bible, that makes it biblical, right? Clearly taught. So we talked about the Church of Philadelphia. We talked about how they're going to be persecuted, but they had strength. Why? They had little strength from the world's point of view, but they kept the word of God. Okay. So what we're going to pick up now is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. So in Revelation 3, 10, it starts, says, Because thou, Church of Philadelphia, has kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The word of my patience, the word of God. So the word of God, also called the living word, is also called Jesus Christ. He is called the word of God. You can find that throughout the Bible. And this church, particularly this church of brotherly love, they hold in the highest esteem the Son of God as Lord and Master of everything in their lives, in their function, in their deeds, in their thoughts, whatever they do. The devil, he hates churches like this. Just like we said, talked about the church of Smyrna, he wanted to persecute them to death. This church, he wants to stand against them. He does everything he can to discredit Jesus. And every time he tries, of course, he fails. So whenever he can't discredit Jesus, whenever all those different people came to question Jesus and Jesus always had an answer and they finally didn't know what else to ask him. Well, guess what? Since he couldn't discredit Jesus, what's his next target? Well, I'll discredit the Bible. I'll discredit the word of God. Jesus, I might not have been able to discredit, but if I can make you doubt the word, then you no longer will trust Jesus, right? And if the Bible truly could be proven unreliable or filled with errors, well, the entire Christian faith doesn't have much of a leg to stand on. That's the basis for what we believe, right? But praise God, the Bible is forever true. And people have been trying for near 2,000 years since it was all put together to discredit it. And as of yet, they fail, right? And I'm very confident they will always fail. So based on the literal reading here, let's read this again. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come on upon all the world to try the, them that dwell upon the earth. What can this mean other than this church, pretty much in whole, is not going to face the tribulation? He doesn't say, I'm going to keep you from tribulation. I mean, they were just being tri went under tribulation from those Jews falsely so-called the previous verse, right? They're going to suffer tribulation. But the promise is, I'm going to keep you from the time of the tribulation. They're not preserved through it. They don't get to, you know, be safely tucked away on the earth. He says, I'm going to keep you from that time. You will not be here for that time because they're kept from it all together. The hour of temptation will not affect them, okay? So what is a biblical hour? Well, it's a synonym for time. It doesn't mean 60 minutes, right? So in Matthew uh, 8.13, it says, And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. He doesn't mean within 60 minutes. He means that at that exact time is when the person was healed, when Jesus said, I'm going to do what you've asked, right? So the only time you would accept that is if you say the sixth hour or the ninth hour. Well, that's actually a measure of time. But you see what he says there. He says the tribulation that I'm going to keep you from, that hour of temptation, will affect everyone on planet Earth. For you to avoid that, by definition, where must you be? 
not on planet Earth, right? Heaven. You cannot be here because it says he's going to affect upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. You can't be dwelling here if you've been preserved from it, if you've been kept from it. So what happens during this hour of temptation? Well, it starts with the Antichrist. We know without a doubt that the church will reign with Christ. That's a promise given to the church. And we know without a doubt that there are thrones in heaven, right, before the Antichrist reigns. There's the throne that Jesus sits on. What are the other thrones? What are the other thrones in heaven? And there's 24 elders, right? And we know without a doubt that the entire world will be tempted and tried during the tribulation. And many during that time will come to Christ at the cost of their own lives, usually by beheading, right? So what groups do we have in heaven when we look at heaven throughout Revelation? Well, there are those who are kept from the hour, and there are those who go through the hour. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Pay attention to those details of what I just read. There are rulers in heaven sitting on thrones, and they are not Jesus. And they are given judgment. They were allowed to judge, right? They were judging the earth, judging those that came through the tribulation and died through the tribulation. Who is it already sitting on thrones in heaven? Well, we already said it. It was the 24 elders, right? So they were separate from the martyrs of the tribulation. They refused the temptation of the Antichrist. When did the Antichrist come to power? At the first seal. So if there are already people in heaven that aren't the ones that come through the hour of temptation, who must they be? Well, frankly, it's the church. The Antichrist, when he forces his mark, he says, if you don't take my mark or my seal or the number of my name, guess what? You can't eat, you can't sell, you can't buy, you can't do anything. So who claims to be the rulers in heaven? Well, you guessed it, the 24 elders. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 10, says, and has made us, the 24 elders speaking, you have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So the church is the only group. Now, the 24 elders are sitting with Jesus, right? The church is the only group promised to sit with Jesus in heavenly places. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. And what do we see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5? Again, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He's the prince of the kings, okay? And he made us to be kings and priests. Daniel chapter 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. How long will they rule? For eternity with him, right? So tribulation Christians, unlike the church, okay, there have some similarities. They are also kings and priests. But as far as we can tell, they don't sit with him as we do, right? So in Revelation 20, there are those sitting in thrones, judging and marking those worthy who came through the tribulation. And those who died during the tribulation, unlike the church who is sitting, or the 24 elders, I'll say specifically, who are sitting in heavenly places, 
What do they do when they arrive in heaven? They are given a priestly role during the millennium, but they're not seated with him. Revelation chapter 7, verse 14. And I said unto him, they asked him, who are these people that are all showing up? People without number. There's so many who died during this tribulation. So they asked uh, John, hey, who are those guys? He said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of the great, which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple? They are given a job, a priestly role, but they're not seated with him on thrones. They're serving him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So all believers, tribulation and previous, will assist Jesus during his eternal rule and during the millennial reign. The apostles were promised rule over the 12 tribes, right? And the church over the Gentile world. And the tribulation saints in the heavenly temple and in the new Jerusalem, right? So each one has a place, but also has their respective roles. And the Bible tells us those things, right? We don't have to guess about that. What's also interesting about this church in Philadelphia is, as we mentioned before, it seems like as a whole, this church is saved. You don't find a lot of false converts in the church of Philadelphia. Why would you want to be? This church had committed God full control. And what happened as a result? They're rejected by the world. There's no social benefit here. You don't get something special for being in the church of Philadelphia. Other so-called Christians look down on you. You look like a pathetic church that's falling apart. You look poor is what you look like to everyone else. But because they remain true to God and they trust his son as their Lord and their Savior, they're removed before the hour of temptation, the great tribulation that's coming. And it's coming on all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. The true church, based on these passages and many others, is not here for the tribulation. The believing Gentiles, and of course, any Jews that accept, that are alive during the tribulation, they're slaughtered and they're killed as martyrs. And But the church is spared from that entire hour, that entire time period. Is everyone following me so far? Good. So then the, um, the mark was then, I mean, all of that then is, uh, all of that is tied up, and then they're up in heaven then before the trumpets even start. No, the trumpets start before those 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 uh mart those martyred saints that are under the uh altar they all happen during the opening of the seals right okay so they're seen in the fifth seal i remember mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and then before the prelude to the seven trumpets is where it's listed that the multitude is seen there right so my what i what i am saying is that throughout the entire seven seals the very first seal is the bringing on of the Antichrist, where he comes to power. And there are those who sign an agreement and trust in him. And the end of the first half of his reign is with him setting up an image of himself in the Holy of Holies. And at that point, Israel takes off. And then he collects the entire world to go to war with Israel. But at that point, he's already made his mark on all the people and told them, hey, this is the only way you're going to get anything done. So people have been essentially compelled to follow his rule or to swear allegiance to him in a way, whether through a mark or through some chip or whatever it is they end up doing. But the point is that through all of that, those who refuse, those who have come to Christ, they're hunted down and beheaded. And they come and fill heaven throughout the entire time. Because even when he sees that great multitude already there, they're like, how long? How long till you take vengeance? They see, Jesus tells them, wait until all your other brethren are killed too. Wait till the rest of them are all killed off. So throughout the entire tribulation, believers are being slaughtered. And Israel is in the crosshairs. All the you know remaining, the remnant is in the crosshairs to be destroyed. But of course, God miraculously will preserve them. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Okay. I just, uh, I just kind of look, you know, it seems like it all kind of goes in succession. So that was kind of my question mm -hmm. because, um, 
you know, the 144,000 get sealed. Right. And then the multitude from the tribulation of seen. And then from there is the prelude to the seven. We're hoping to get to that in 2024. <laughs> but since we were talking about no i'm just teasing you're walking around just messing with you no is it appears then if that is the mm -hmm. martyred tribulation saints that that just kind of happens earlier than i thought well I, yeah i think it happens continuously and again do i think all of them die on the same day no but i think when he sees them there they're just collecting there throughout the tribulation as they're being hunted down and wiped out I mean, remember, the peace of the Antichrist, by his peace, he shall destroy many. This is before he even goes to war. So even during the good years, which there aren't really any good years of an Antichrist, but even during the good years of this false Christ, he's killing people in droves. By his peace, he shall destroy many. So just think about the time frame connecting it to the seals and him being the one represented in the first seal. I think people are turning against believers big time. Right. And you also have to remember, in Europe today, one of their big problems is this immigration issue, right? That's what the people are upset about. And they're looking for a new unifying leader. And it's interesting that there is this talk of the king of the South, some other conglomeration of people at first go against the king of the North. They go against the Antichrist. It seems like this confederation of armies try to stand against him at first and he withstands them and destroys them you know and there's again we'll get to all that whenever we kind of review a little bit of the book of daniel but it's just very interesting how he takes power and at first he's opposed and then he defeats people and then his he acts like he's a representation of god but it turns out he's very much anti-god so there's a whole lot to learn about the antichrist i think that's a good point we just again it'll be i don't know if it'll be 2024 but it's beginning to look that way but anyways um, I was going to say, well, <laughs> I'll be in heaven changing my notes for the things I missed. <laughs> like, wait, that's not right. <laughs> um, anyways, so uh, again, this church is spared, right? The believing church is spared from this hour of temptation, which goes right along with what the Bible promised, right? In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. He knows how to keep the wicked to be punished and how to take the godly and remove them and to preserve them. In the context of the tribulation, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That was in the context of the coming judgment. History tells us, that David, whenever he was anointed king, okay, when was David anointed king? Did he become king the next day? No, years later. He didn't immediately take the throne. Instead, actually, he was exiled for a while, was he not? He was kicked out of the nation. That's in 1 Samuel 22, 2 Samuel 23, and 1 Chronicles 11 talks about it. He ran from Saul, right? He was out there getting his merry men, all these faithful people came to him, right? The merry men, because we think of the story of Robin Hood, it's very similar, right? Um, he took people that were in debt, people that were in danger, people that were just unhappy with the current world, and he transformed them into mighty men, right? He empowered them, gave them strength, gave them a purpose, showed them something, saved them from the corrupt leaders that they were under. But they were still outlaws to the kingdom. He then ultimately returns to take the throne, right? After the other king is overthrown. And the mighty men that were with him all along, they were given positions of power and leadership over the kingdom, right? But when does he take the throne? Well, he takes the first seven years just over his people. He takes the first seven years over Judah and doesn't go over the rest of Israel. The rest of Israel is still under a false king, under Saul's kid, right? Or Saul's grandkid. So later on, he then takes the entire nation, seven years after taking the throne of just Judah. That's a very similar parallel to Jesus Christ. He came to this earth. He was anointed king, right? But then where? He went to heaven because this world rejected him. But when he comes back, he wants to come back for his people, for Israel. But for the first, what we believe to be seven years, he's going to take 
his own people, be crowned king, and then his rule will extend to the whole nation, or in Jesus' case, to the whole world. Right? First Kings. Oh, I got you. The age of the years. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, in 1 Kings 2.11 is where you see the passage. It says, and David reigned over Israel for 40 years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron and 33 years in Jerusalem. It's exactly right. So again, this parallels Jesus in the church. Jesus was given everything at the resurrection. He went to heaven. He was seated at the right hand of power, but he did not immediately lay claim to everything in this earth that is his. But instead... Through the Holy Spirit, he's been gathering to himself mighty men. He's been gathering to himself a people, believers, men, women, people who give their life to Jesus Christ. And then he will be rejoined to those people. And they will be given positions of power, positions of authority. And then he's going to come back and claim the entire earth with these mighty men. And of course, when I say men, I mean all people, right? Um, and the church is promised to reign with Christ. And it will happen. So what's he say in verse 11? We'll finally look at that. We're moving along here. Verse 11 he says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. So the entire world is looking for the apocalypse, right? Everyone's looking for the judgment and the apocalypse, and this big meteor is going to hit the earth, and this disease is going to come up, right? That's what everyone is, keeps expecting. Watch movies, and they're always about catastrophic events that are going to come and bring the end of days. They're looking for signs of the Antichrist. And if you look at some of these prophetic websites, all their, this might be the Antichrist, and that might be the Antichrist, and everybody wants to know, what's the mark of the beast? Is it GPS? Is it some kind of microchip? Is it paper money? Look at this symbol on the dollar sign. It's got an all-seeing eye. It must be horrible. It's the 5G, right? A few years ago, 5G was the big enemy. That's not what the church is looking for. We're not looking for signs of the Antichrist. We're not looking for signs of the apocalypse. We are looking for the return of Christ. That's where our eyes are, right? The next thing on the church's horizon is the rapture. We look for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. As recorded through every letter to every church, that's what they should be looking for. And once we're gone, you know, once we are in heaven, then comes the signs of the apocalypse. Then comes all the things that happen. So the apocalypse and the Antichrist, they have very little, if anything, to do with our timeline. But once the Antichrist is revealed, one of two things, depending on how you read the passage, either the church is now gone, so the Antichrist is revealed, or the Antichrist is revealed as the church is going. I mean, really, it's the two ways to look at it. So in the Thessalonians, they were fixated on the rapture, and they were convinced that it was the next thing to happen, and they were so convinced that they were constantly worried that they had missed it. I mean, that's their constant stress. Wait, if you're looking for an antichrist and an apocalypse first, why would you think you've missed it? But they were they were so convinced that the very next thing for the church is the rapture. Did Paul ever say, no, you're wrong? No. He said, no, don't worry, guys. You haven't missed it. You don't see the antichrist yet, do you? You haven't missed it yet. Um, in Romans 8.23, it says, not only they, talking to the Romans now, Paul says, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The church was eager for the glorification of the body, just like we remain eager for the glorification of the body. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He's almost here. James chapter 5, verse 8, be also you patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. What is the encouragement to the saints always? Is it the apocalypse is coming? Is the antichrist is coming? So that means Jesus is coming soon after? Or is the next step for the church the rapture? Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a church that's in tune with Christ, unlike the previous church, right? We've talked about these other church, Church of Sardis. This one's in tune with Christ. They're focused on faith. They know their Bibles. They kept to the word of his faith, the word of his patience. They know the word of God. They love their Lord. He's the focus of their lives. Even before their own work, even before their own neighbors, before their own country, and sometimes you would say even before their own family, 
except for wanting to bring their family in to know him, right? They know this church knows what to expect and when to expect it because Jesus is not going to come as a thief to them. Just like he's not going to come as a thief to the Thessalonians. He will come as a thief to the church in Sardis because they had a name that was alive, but they were dead. They weren't watching and waiting for their Lord. So all this church needs to do is to stick with it. Keep doing what you're doing and you're not going to lose your crown. Now, they already have their crown, right? They already have their rewards. Jesus already promised them their rewards. So the only other church, by the way, in the, the churches of Revelation to have a crown is guess which church? Revelation 2.10 talks about the church of Smyrna having the crown as well. Do you see where God rewards those who put him first, those who are willing to die for him and put him as the focus of their lives and not worry about whatever garbage this world has to offer? Because the best the world can offer is nothing but garbage. It's all going to deteriorate and fall apart anyway. But the whole world's out chasing money, chasing all these different uh, pleasures for a season. For what? So the only loss of rewards, right, for this church is if they let go of honoring Christ and they follow man. Now, we can see from this church that's not the case. They kept the word of his patience. So, again, this has nothing to do with losing salvation, right? He counsels them, don't take away your crown. Crowns are rewards talked about throughout the Bible, right? There's the incorruptible crown in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. The crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. The crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4, 8. Crown of life in James and the crown of glory in 1 Peter. But the point is, there are probably many more crowns. We don't know. All we know is that God says, I've got rewards and I am designing a great place for you. So I can only imagine, literally, that song is a great song and it's a true statement. You can't, actually, the answer should be, I can't only imagine. Because you can't. You cannot, it has not entered into your mind. All you know is what the Bible tells you. And that's just, it's unlawful for man to speak of what God's preparing for us. That's according to Paul. You can't even talk about it because it's illegal. How amazing it is. Well, anyway, we get to verse 12. It says, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. We're going to pause there. We're going to talk about this uh, verse here in a few minutes. We're going to go and take a five-minute break. Any final comments on those first couple of verses?